Okay, last but not least, we have Professor Martha Thompson from Boston University, uh, Professor of Psychological and Brain Sciences. Come on up. Make sure I know how this thing works. No. Aim it at the booth. Okay. It must be me. And I'm also not getting any notes. Do I get any notes? Oh, they're right there. Oh, there you go. Okay. So today I want to talk, oops, today I want to talk about evidence-based approaches for treating mood disorders. Um, and I want to point out that a lot of our strategies for approaching dealing with mood disorders uh, are our evidence-based strategies are seeking social support, seeking professional help. Cognitive behavioral therapy is supported, behavioral activation, taking medication. All of these are some evidence-based approaches for treating mood disorders. However, we have the symptoms of mood disorders, lack of energy, social withdrawal. We have irritability, reassurance seeking, lack of pleasure, poor concentration. All of these are things that get in the way of people accessing care. And um, further, interpersonal stressors can increase depression in a process known as stress generation. The symptoms of depression fuel interpersonal conflict, isolation, and in decrease social support. And this enhanced stress context then fuels depression in this downward spiral known as stress generation. I, uh, I think this passage from a father of a depressed 13-year-old girl illustrates this interpersonal stress generation process pretty well. And I'm just going to step over here and read it because, because I think it's easier. Uh, basically, she's a sweet girl, very caring. The relationship between she and I was always close. With time, she tended to pull away a lot. We've seen her basically become more quiet, to get angry, to be to herself quite a lot. The more and more we'd try to push her, the more and more she tended to shy away a little bit. You could see something was troubling her, and her anger seems to get triggered often, depending on how you speak to her. So sometimes frustration levels in myself toward her get elevated, and we tend to have arguments, and there's punishments, and things like that. So sometimes the relationship can ship can get strained at that point. She has trouble in school with doing homework, so there's always constant arguments. So again, the frustrations that happen between us can sometimes elevate, so it gets going off to a defensive mode, so then she tends to get very angry. I think this really illustrates that stress generation process that I uh, am trying to emphasize here. So across the lifespan, families are called upon to assist in dealing with mood disorders and other psychiatric disorders. And unfortunately, families are often ill-equipped to help. They have no idea what to do. They do not necessarily have the knowledge or the skills to intervene. I'd like to talk a little bit today about integrating families in treatment and how we can provide skills, reduce stress, and improve coping. So family-focused treatment for childhood depression provides a framework for treating children with depression. And while much research has focused on the development of, and testing of adolescent depression interventions, very little has focused on younger kids. So I'm going to talk about a developmentally tailored model that provides a child-friendly rationale for comprehensive depression treatment and allows for the potential integration of numerous additional intervention components. All right. So what does family-focused treatment look like? Well, we do individual psychoeducation with parents and children. We present an interpersonal model of depression, which is underscored by that stress generation model. And we help families identify interpersonal processes, including what we call upward and downward spirals. And I'm going to give you a sense of those. All right. So here's an upward spiral in families. We love to see this. So let's say a child comes home from school. They're in a good mood. 
they say, hey, mom, can I help you set the table for dinner? I know pa parents are probably thinking this doesn't happen. Uh, say the parent says, thank you. Child feels even better, says, hey, mom, can we do something fun later? Mom says, yes. Both are improved. So this is what we call an upward spiral. We love to see these in families, and one of the things we really work on is identifying these. But we also see downward spirals in families, and they, this may feel slightly more familiar to many of us. As, let's say dad comes home. He's feeling irritable. It's been a bad day. He snaps at the child. Child gets angry. He feels even worse, so then he yells. Child cries, goes to the room. Both of them are feeling terrible. So we see this as this downward spiral, this interaction, the stress generation where interaction fuels negative emotion, negative emotion is fueling further interaction. And so our goal here is to change this process. So I told you a little bit about the, what we do initially, we're identifying those processes in families, and then we want to target those processes and change them. We want to increase those upward spirals. We want to stop those downward spirals in their tracks and turn them around. So we begin to do skills building in the family where we focus on communication enhancement, and I think that is the heart of it, is communication enhancement. We do problems, uh, fun activities, scheduling, behavioral activation within a family context. We do problem solving, and we do relapse prevention. And ultimately, what we'd like to do is identify what we call the core downward spirals. What are those things? What are those repetitive downward spirals that happen. And I think any of you who've been married or in a relationship, you know about this core downward spiral. It's that fight you have again and again with your partner that never seems to get resolved but perpetuates. And we want to, inter we want to be able to identify those in families and begin to address those processes. So what do we know about the impact of family-focused treatment for childhood depression? I'm going to tell you about the findings from a two-site randomized clinical trial conducted between Boston University and UCLA. It's the largest clinical trial of depressed kids to date. Let's see the treatments we compared. Well, first we compared our family-focused treatment. I've told you all a little bit about that. We compared it to an individual supportive psychotherapy for a number of reasons. This is a treatment that's modeled after usual care. It's typical of what kids get out there in the world. Um, it's focused on a child-centered approach. It primi primarily involves individual meetings with a child, but also involves individual sessions with parents, and provi provides primarily supportive, empathic listening and non-directive problem solving. It's actually a pretty powerful comparator, I would say. So here was our randomized clinical trial. We recruited half of our participants at UCLA and half at Boston University. So we have a, a bi-coastal approach. And um, they were randomized after initial assessment, were randomized half to family-focused treatment, half to individual therapy. We stratified on gender, site, and antidepressant medication. Um, and then we followed kids up immediately post-treatment, four months post-treatment, and nine months post-treatment. Uh, this gives you a little bit about the sample demographics. It's kind of a dense slide, and so I'd like to just focus on this aspect of it right here. And what we really, because there were no differences between our treatment groups in any way, our typical participant was a around 11-year-old kid. And, um, we had a few more girls than boys early in development. We don't see the same kinds of gender differences in depression risk that we see uh, in the emerging adolescent period and on into adulthood. Um, and we had a range of uh, ethnic and racial groups. Um, here we go. All right. In terms of clinical characteristics, about 60. Nine, 68 percent of our participants had uh, major depression diagnoses. We also had kids who had dis what was then DSM-4 dysthymic disorder, we now call persistent depressive disorder. We had a subgroup of our kids who also had those double depressions, where they have di uh, dysthymic symptoms and then they dip down and have those major depressive episodes on top of those symptoms. And we had a few kids who were what we call depression NOS, and those were just 
sub uh, threshold for major depressive disorder. You can see that there was a high level of comorbidity, which is very, very typical of kids, and this only includes the anxiety and ADHD comorbidities. And we had kids on a range of medications, although we had a surprisingly small number of kids who came in on antidepressant medications, and I've, which I can talk about later. Chronic symptoms were typical in our sample, which means over a year of symptoms of depression, which may not seem like a lot, but when you're nine years old, it represents a significant portion of your developmental uh, history. Um, and our, uh, our major outcome measure, the uh, child depression rating scale, represented moderate levels of depression that did not differ across treatment groups. So we evaluated two major outcomes. The first we call depression treatment response. This is greater than or equal to a 50% reduction on this, uh, the child depression rating scale, which is the gold standard for measuring depression in clinical trials in kids, both uh, teens and younger kids. And then we also included depression remission, which meant that they had less than or equal to a score of 28 on the CDRS. And we included that because that's consistent with antidepressant treatment trials. All right. So what did we see? Well, we found that among our uh, family-focused treatments, we saw, uh, we saw about an 80 percent cl adequate clinical response, whereas we saw about 60 percent for the individual treatment. And if we looked at the stricter criteria of depression remission, we see about 55 percent response for family-focused treatment and about a 35 percent response for the individual treatment. All right. We also looked at patient-centered outcomes. So how did families feel about the treatment that they were getting? And we found that parents and children liked both treatments. Our uh, individual supportive therapy is a powerful treatment, and it involves a lot of alliance building with the child. And parents and children felt that, I think, and they liked their therapist, then they liked the, their uh, treatment. But what we did find that was, was that parents in family-focused treatment, compared to those in individual psychotherapy, were more likely to endorse that the therapy helped them understand how to manage my child's depression and how to help my child at home. And these are the core skills we were trying to build in many ways. Children in family-focused treatment, compared to those in individual psychotherapy, were more likely to endorse that therapy helped me get along with my family and deal with my problems. So we had, have evidence for the impact on our family-focused treatment on family member self-efficacy and skill. So what uh, I, we also looked at ratings on the uh, CDRS over time, and we do see that when we go out further after treatment is over, we see that the gains made by those in family-focused treatment tend to maintain, but those in individual therapy, even though it's stopped, do tend to catch up. And we see this also when we look at the child depression inventory, which is the self-rating. We see that same sort of pattern. Um, when we look at additional outcomes, we uh, can see the number of emergency department visits, hospitalizations, non-suicidal self-injury, suicide attempts, and recurrence. And we begin, I think, to see some signal, especially, whoop, gotta go back, okay. Especially here, where we see differences in these variables. And indeed, hot off the press, this week, we completed some analyses examining the impact of family-focused treatment on some of these risk outcomes. So we created a composite variable of suicidal and self-injurious thoughts and behaviors, and using a PATH analysis conducted in M+, we demonstrated an indirect PATH in which family-focused treatment led to greater adequate clinical response, and that that adequate 
clinical response predicted in the follow-up period lower levels of self-injurious and suicidal behaviors in youth. I think these are particularly exciting findings because we know so little about the nature of suicidal and self-injurious uh, processes in this age group, and we know even less about their treatment. So I think that um, this really illustrates the importance of engaging families in that process. So in I will put my conclusions up there. You can, I think they're up there. You can see them. And um, our next steps are going to be to do telehealth implementation. And I'd like to include some text messaging interventions where families can get throughout the week. Remember, you're, you're saying what you liked. That's one of our ways in which we help families increase positive affect. Um, and then also to look at how our family-based interventions may impact underlying neural vulnerabilities and mechanisms in uh, depression and its perpetuations. So thank you. And I'll acknowledge, whoops, anyway, acknowledge my, acknowledge my team. Acknowledgements. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned that the parents reported more knowledge of being able to handle depression. Did you get any self-report on how they're feeling or their mood or their symptoms at all? You know, this is tricky. Um, we did and we did not see changes that were different across the treatments. Across both treatments, we see improvements, and these tend to go along with children's improvements. Um, that said, one of, the, one of the hardest things about working with depressed kids is just the incredible amount of heterogeneity that we see. Um, and so we see changes across many variables, but they didn't differ a lot between the two treatments. But we're still following up looking at those moderators. Thank you. Other, other change processes, so. This phenomenon that you observed of individual treatments catching up. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. That's what I've been wondering, and I think it's interesting to think that we still are seeing the impacts on self-injurious self behaviors and thoughts and suicidal behaviors and thoughts in that follow-up period, even though we're not seeing a continued increase in, uh, in, in terms of improvement in symptoms. I think it also speaks to the need in mood disorders in young people to really have a more, um, a longer treatment process and one that ha uh, is more of a step-down kind of process. And if we want to keep those changes going, we may need to add additional components. So, yeah. Thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, my question kind of refers to the relative cost between the family-focused versus the individual-focused approach. And by cost, I don't mean necessarily dollars, but like time and effort by the child, the family, and the therapist. I'm just wondering mm -hmm. how, how much effort is needed for either of these two approaches. Well, it's interesting because I feel like that's sort of a moving target in some ways. The cost in terms of therapist is probably similar, although I think in general we need to do a lot more training of therapists and working with families. Um, uh, there's an access issue. Um, in terms of families, traditionally parents bring kids to treatment, so they're coming in so many ways. So how can we better engage them would be my question. Now, as we move to more telehealth models, I think that may be changing. And we need to be thinking about how we can better integrate families into treatment, into care, um, in cost-effective ways with telehealth. I think it's important, um, I haven't linked this to the broader literature, but there's a lot of research looking at bipolar disorders, for example, and how in integrating families in treatment may 
assist them in being able to build the skills necessary to manage the disorder and then those, those kinds of effects carry into the follow-up when we are no longer doing those kinds of treatments. So I think in some ways it pays off. And in those studies, we actually find lower rates of hospitalization and lower rates of relapse, which I think have tremendous potential uh, impact on costs, which have yet to be measured. <laughs>